So I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Clark, who is the Executive Director of the National Association of Social Workers. And it's going to be a very exciting presentation. I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, I am the CEO of the National Association of Social Workers here in the United States. Uh, I didn't have far to come. Our offices are right here in Washington, so it made it uh, quite easy to get here today. Oncology's been my clinical specialty ever since I got out of graduate school. Uh, I've always been involved in oncology in some capacity, and as social workers, we have a very vested interest in oncology as a field of practice. I'm pleased to be here today, though, representing uh, an organization that I'm a member of. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Sea Change, Collaborating to Conquer Cancer. And I'm here today as the uh, co-chair of the Sea Change Workforce Initiative. My co-chair is Ed Benz, Dr. Ed Benz, who is the Director of Oncology at Dana-Farber Hospital. Uh, and he could not be here today, but it, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Ed on this initiative. Just to give you a little bit of background, and I know later today you're going to hear from someone who's actually running the Sea Change organization, but let me just say a little bit about Sea Change to give you just a bit of an understanding about why we're doing this initiative. Sea Change is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. It is housed here in Washington. It is an organization of leaders. It's been around for a little over 10 years, and it has private members, meaning people who are in private practice of some sort. We have public members and we have not-for-profit members, people who work at not-for-profit organizations. I fill one of the seats for not-for-profit uh, organization. And one of the things that uh, we want to do at, at Sea Change is to take on initiatives that couldn't be done by any of us alone. And so in that spirit, I want to talk a bit about this uh, important initiative. When I first came to Washington about a decade ago, I joined a coalition, or we joined a coalition, the association did, called Patients in Peril. And I thought, yet in, in the last decade, I haven't heard a better title for a coalition. It was a, a coalition of various health professions who at that time were saying, how are we going to handle the aging population? We don't have enough staff, none of us, no matter whether you were in pharmacy or OT or PT or speech or nursing or whatever. None of us at that table had enough staff. Well, that went on for some time, and we didn't gain nearly the headway that we had hoped, and eventually, as many coalitions do, it disappeared from the landscape. But we do th have today, I think, some real challenges ahead of us, and I do believe that people with cancer are going to be patients in peril. So I'm happy today to talk a little bit about this initiative. Uh, I love this picture of a wave here. This is actually titled The Great Wave, and it's by a Japanese artist. And it depicts an enormous wave threatening boats uh, near the Japanese coast. While some people would assume this is a tsunami, the wave is, as the picture's title notes, more likely to be an okonami, literally a wave of the ocean, open sea. And I think it's a beautiful depiction of where we are today. We're facing a wave in an open sea. The currents are an aging population, expanded access of care through insurance coverage, and we're all pleased about that, but we all know we aren't ready for the people we have now, so to add in another 35 million makes it pretty daunting. And we know that we have greater survivorship, and every one of us applauds that. We want people to live with cancer, to have normal lives after a cancer diagnosis. But we know that these combined are really swamping our current healthcare institutions and the workforce. If we talk about the challenge to professionals, and if we're looking at the cancer workforce, let me just give you a couple quick numbers here. Uh, we know that demand for oncologists is expected to exceed supply by almost 30% in 2020. Uh, I know the social work labor force quite well, and I can tell you that we've had a shortage of social workers for the last decade. Uh, over about 12 years ago, the National Institutes of Aging said we would need 70,000 additional social workers. By 2010, we had 3,000 trained in gerontology in 3010, or 2010. Uh, I also know that social workers uh, are older than the average professional, and we expect to see 30% of our licensed social workers retire in the next decade. By 2020, we will have a shortage of registered nurses that will be greater than one million. Cancer registrars, the demand is estimated to grow 10% in the next 15 years. And more than 20% of the U.S. population lives in areas deemed as health professional shortage areas. And we also know, and every one of us in the room know this, that people of color are not well represented in our healthcare professions. 
So what does this mean for us then as we look at, um, at society if we don't have enough professionals to help individuals with cancer? Well, we also know we will have too few researchers to find cures, too few educators to avoid risk, too few navigators to find answers, too few clinicians to provide care, too few experts to address special needs, and too few advocates to push for change. And I think that last bullet point is why this meeting is so important. From the patient perspective, we know that the last thing a person with cancer needs to worry about is can they find a doctor? when we listened to our In the Trenches speech a minute ago and you heard about people having to drive 300 miles to get to a physician. What does that mean? Uh, we don't think people should have to worry about if their nurse will be skilled enough to give their chemo, if their social worker will have time to be able to address their emotional needs, or if one of the many more professionals is available uh, to meet the complex needs of a person and a family dealing with cancer. With this uh, existing and projected shortage that's coming about, the current and worsening impact to individuals at risk for living with cancer is significant. We will see delays in diagnosis. We heard today about longer wait times. We know that there are delays in treatment for a variety of reasons. We know that care is provided by less experienced or expert professionals in some institutions. We know there's less frequent interaction with clinical and supportive services. We know there will be delays in the evaluation and management of symptoms, worsening health disparities, and decreased clinical trial enrollment. As a result, you know, what should be considered the standard of care becomes an elusive luxury. And it's hard to think about that for those of us who had careers in oncology for a long time, that a standard of care is now a luxury. So just a summary of the challenges that we're facing today. Uh, widespread shortages. We know the demand for cancer services exceeds current and projected needs. Uh, the literature says that very, very shortly, cancer will be the number one cause of death, outstripping heart disease worldwide. So when we talk about the numbers of people that we're going to see with cancer, whether it's through early detection or whether they're aging, uh, those numbers are going to be huge. And we also know, and this is a challenge, is that many organizations are addressing discipline-specific or specialty-specific cancer workforce issues. We're all doing that in some capacity. What we haven't been doing is addressing it as a team, looking at this as a national problem. So Sea Change decided that this is something they could take on because they do have uh, representatives, as I said, from all the different sectors. and. Uh, We've called it a national strategy for strengthening the cancer workforce. The goal of this strategy is to define and pursue a coordinated national strategy for ensuring the capacity and skills of the cancer workforce of the future. Uh, again, as we go through this today, and it won't take me too long to go through it, please understand this is a starting point. We are not putting this out there as an end point. We're asking each of you, though, to join in this initiative to help us move this uh, this goal forward. We started by developing guiding principles for the initiative, and there are three of them. Uh, they're pretty simple, but also very important. We need to increase the quantity of the workforce, we need to increase the quality of the workforce, and we need to improve value. Uh, and I'm hoping today as we go through a few of these strategies that it will trigger some ideas that you have that perhaps we can incorporate into the strategy. Number one, we need more healthcare professionals. I don't think anybody would um, dispute that. We need to recruit, retain, and support re-entry of cancer professionals to expand the capacity of the workforce. Uh, one of the things that I think we are struggling with is cancer prof professionals need to be aggressively promoted, uh, and I mean as rewarding, stable, and important careers, the cancer professions. I don't know that we do that well. Uh, it's seldom that you hear a young person, say a high school student, say, I really want to have a career in cancer. It's unusual to hear a social work student say that at a master's level because of some of the stigma that's still there with the disease. And you heard Joan talk about how depressing it can be for someone when you've lost a lot of patients in a short period of time. That stigma is still out there. So it's hard to recruit people into our profession or into the oncology profession. Uh, we also know that students and professionals need to be retained by supporting their success and satisfaction. 
One of the things that we're all dealing with, I think, in our workforces are the intergenerational workforces. Uh, we have the baby boomers. Uh, we have the Gen Xers, and we now have the Millennials. They do not speak the same language. They do not always have the same goals. Um, we know that they feel rewarded in different ways. We've been doing a lot of work on that, and Sea Change has actually had some wonderful uh, input about looking at the Millennials and how we're attracting Millennials, the, the, young, the youngest professional, into our uh, workforce. Uh, they don't want to work like you and I have worked our whole career. That is not actually a huge value for them. They see a work-life balance as something that's very important. Uh, we talk about how scared we are that they're so disconnected and they're online all the time. They are the most connected generation we have ever seen. They're just connected in a way different from the way you and I are connected. And that really creates an issue for us. And when you talk about the electronic medical record, that isn't a problem for the millennials at all. They have been using computers since they were six years old. Uh, it's just an amazing difference, and we have to find ways to move them into those areas where they're most comfortable and uh, use their skills as best we can. We need to uh, build and strengthen the pipeline. Uh, in the, at the registration desk, there are actually some materials that have been developed that I think are fairly uh, significant. One of them is a speaker's kit for careers in cancer. I hope you'll pick up one. It's a CD that really talks about why people might wish to choose a career in cancer, a young person, a high school student, for example. Uh, we know that it's an opportunity to make a difference. And if you look at the millennials, one of the things they most want is to make a difference sort of their byword is we want to do something to change society. They're back to sort of a couple generations ago, and that's what they want to do. So if we could help them understand that going into oncology might be able to help them change the world in a different way, that would be a positive for bringing them in. Uh, the the um, speaker's kit also includes possible career paths, and it actually gives selected views of different, different professions in oncology. There's so many different professions to choose from. Uh, I think sometimes when I look at college students today and they are looking through what they might decide to become, it is so different from the choices that some of us had, that uh, particularly women in my generation, you had the nurse, you had the teacher, and I found social work. So it was one of those uh, the three female dominated professions. Solution two, training health professionals. We do know that we need to train and retain cancer professionals, professionals and strengthen their knowledge and skills. Um, we heard earlier today a little bit about how hard it is to stay current on all the things that are happening out there today. But this is our second guiding principle, that this is a driver of quality if we don't train and retrain and strengthen the workforce that we have today with knowledge and skills. We know that there are rapid scientific discoveries going on, advances in information technology. This makes preparing health professionals all the more important. We know that constant learning is required. Many people have certifications or credentials that require them to have continuing education every year. Uh, we know, and I hope we're working more in teams, uh, and it's an increasingly complex healthcare system. Um, we know that we are also meeting the needs of an increasingly diverse population, and it adds another complexity, a layer of complexity to all of this. So one of the things that we need to be doing is to promote cancer specialty certification among all health professions, or as many as we can. We do need to improve the competency of the non-oncology health professional <laughs> by infusing cancer competency into their training. We aren't going to have enough specifically trained cancer professionals to meet the need tomorrow or 10 years from now. But we have health professionals out there. What could we do to help the average health professional from the person at the front desk or the information desk when you walk in the hospital to somewhere else to understand something about oncology. And let me just tell you, there are untapped opportunities here. If you look at nurses, we know that there are almost 2 million registered nurses out there, but there are only 30,000 of them who are oncology certified. Think about that. That's a huge gap. In social work, we have 320,000 licensed clinical social workers, but we actually have 670,000 practicing social workers today, and only 1,200 of them are actually credentialed in any way in oncology social work. The opportunities are huge to help some of these individuals go forward. So another initiative that uh, Sea that, uh, Change did was what we called the cancer, ooh, I just lost everything. Sorry? Hit what? 
All right, well, okay, well, I can continue talking. It's not a, not in, all right, I'll keep talking. <clears throat> well, let me talk about the Cancer Core Competency Initiative. Um, or, I'm sorry, we were, let me go on to the next slide. We decided that we could really do something with this. Sea Change has so many various professionals that are part of the uh, initiative. We brought them together and we actually said, we can do this. We can look at core competencies. What are required for any individual with regard to cancer? Well, one of the things that we decided was that we could do this based on research. And we brought in experts. I'm sorry, I don't know what I did, but it disappeared. Thank you. That was very easy. Thank you. The first thing we did was to convene a national expert panel. Uh, and we developed competency standards. No? No? What am I doing here? Did I step on someone? OK. We developed competency standards that define the core knowledge and skills. Let me uh, see if I can give you an example of this. Many of us now have been trained in what we would call cultural competencies. And so you think about the fact that are any of us really ever culturally aware? I mean, culturally competent. We may be culturally aware. We may even be culturally sensitive. But few of us ever get to culturally competent. Uh, you would almost have to be of the area you're looking at, the ethnic group or whatever, to say that you're culturally competent. Well, the same can be true of cancer. But we can teach basic competencies in cancer. It is not an impossibility. So we took these competencies that were developed by experts. They were research-based. And then we pilot tested them in five different areas with five different groups of professionals. And we found that uh, it, was, it, it was very well researched and very well documented that we could deliver both quantitative and qualitative improvements in working with a group of, let's say, med students who are going to be helping screen for melanoma. We could actually help them have a better competency. And so tools that were developed are actually flexible and very useful. And again, there's information available for the uh, competencies, let me just tell you, uh, at cancer competency.org. So if you get a chance to look at these, I think it's very important. The cancer workforce of the future is going to have to focus on cancer knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And we're going to have to use healthcare professionals. Remember, if it's going to be the number one disease in this country and in the world, we're going to have to use other healthcare professionals to fill the gap. And it's going to have to be done through competency more so than through numbers. Third solution maximize health professionals. We heard a little bit about this in the previous presentation. We do want to optimize the role and the organization of cancer professionals to realize the full value of the workforce. Um, we believe that certainly cancer professionals should be supported to apply their entire scope of practice. Another way to say that is we want everyone to be able to work at the top of their license, not the bottom of it. So we want people to be able to do the highest level skill they can bring to the picture versus something, as we heard earlier, saying you shouldn't be pushing paper when you're a, a certified oncology nurse. That's a poor use of your license. Uh, I can say that one of the problems we have there is that uh, licensing is not reciprocal in different states uh, for different professions. And let me just use social work as, a, as an example. I could be licensed in Washington, D.C., and I would not be licensed to practice in Maryland or Virginia. I live in Maryland. I work in Washington, D.C., but if I wish to do social work in those two states, I'd have to go through two different licensing processes. And the real problem we have is that the, the license titles are not always comparable. So a clinical social worker, a CSW in one state, may be a certified social worker at a different level in another state. So we have no way to move across states. And I want to come back to that in just a minute uh, when we talk about advocacy and what we can do. But we should be organizationally supported to leverage our time, our talent, and our distribution. The new initiative, and I do think this is an exciting initiative, and I want to credit Ed Benz with coining the phrase, the care force. We've just recently, uh, in the last year or so, begun working on the cancer care force. And be be beyond traditionally trained cancer professionals, many individuals play an important role in cancer care. These include family members. We all know that we are, as we say, discharging people sicker and quicker. Who picks up that slack? Things that we used to do in hospitals are now done by a family member somewhere in the uh, household. We have volunteers. We have lay patient navigators. We have community health workers. And we have clergy. However, if you look at the literature 
uh, for describing the role, systems, and impacts of this care force. And we use that term very advisedly because there is a whole care force out there beyond the professional workforce. But if you look at the literature, it's very sparse. Uh, and we think there's really quite a great opportunity here to better understand, engage, and support these individuals in the important roles they're playing. Let me just use an example. I come out of hospital administration. I can't imagine running a hospital without your volunteer department. Uh, and if you are doing it correctly, you'll be able to tell me how much money you save by having all those volunteers and how many hours they work every year. If you're running a hospice, we know that one of the major components of a hospice is a hospice volunteer. It's one of the major components. And every hospice can tell you, they can give you a price tag on how much money the volunteers have actually saved them because they've brought in the volunteers. Now that's with training, that's with supervision, that's with support. But these are still people who are part of the care force, not the professional workforce. Well, Sea Change has committed to improving our collective understanding of the current and potential impact of the care force and through efforts to, to document current practices in recruitment, training, and support, we will also look at barriers and opportunities for improvement. And to begin, we've actually completed a systematic um, review of, of current and potential practices through a series of key informant interviews, through care force focus groups, we'll be conducting several, conducting several more of those in the near future, and through surveys. So we want to know, what is it about the care force? Uh, one of the things that most of us know sitting in this room is that most healthcare professionals also volunteer somewhere. It's sort of amazing when you look at the volunteer work that we do, uh, the unpaid work that we do. Uh, but we want to know more about it. Uh, and this, these findings will provide background for Sea Change to host a Care Force Summit that we hope to have in the first uh, half of next year, where we're going to bring in cancer leaders and Care Force spokespersons to identify priorities for collective action. So when we talk about a national strategy, we also have a national strategy for a call to action. And this looks at five different areas. First are the federal policymakers. One of the things that happened several years ago, and some of you in the room might have been appointed to this, was that there was a very exciting commission that was going to take place. And President Obama appointed people to fill the National Health Workforce Commission. And we thought, this is really great. This is what we need to start looking at the workforce shortages that we have. And people were selected. Uh, many of us wrote letters of support to individuals. And we were so happy about the group that was selected. There were cancer survivors on that group. And we thought, this is really, really great. Well, the Workforce Commission has been established, the people have been selected, and no money has been appropriated. So to my knowledge, it has never met. Uh, and that seems to me to be a real lost opportunity. So these are the kind of things that we can really talk about as we go forward about these are highly qualified people. Can we get some appropriation for the National Health Workforce Commission? Can we promote job creation? Can we create a national approach to licensing across state lines to assist the underserved communities? One of the other areas that we're going to have to start looking at is what happens with um, telemedicine, telecounseling, and social work. We're looking at that in a big way because right now, according to a lot of state licensing laws, you can only, you can only counsel someone online if you're a social worker if both you and that person are in your state. Well, that then, if you're right near a border and you're looking at rural areas, that prohibits immediately then doing anything that might uh, assist there. We also need to look at education and training and do some advocacy as we're looking at education and training. We need to, and we really need to educate students to be informed health consumers. I don't know um, how much education today, some of you might have teachers in your family, et cetera, but for many people, eighth grade health was the last education they got about health care. They don't know where their organs are in their body. They don't have much information. They're not health literate. Uh, we've actually fallen down, I think, in this country in trying to help individuals really understand how important it is to take responsibility for your own health care. Uh, I think we need to do more about creating internships and scholarships if we're going to bring people into the health professions. And we certainly need to expand program capacity and diversity of our programs, uh, something that is very, very needed. With regard to health and healthcare institutions, uh, we know that transdisciplinary care is important. Uh, when I began, um, when I began my career, we had multidisciplinary care. You remember that? And then we had interdisciplinary care. 
and now we have transdisciplinary care. Uh, it still means teamwork, and we still aren't doing it well. So it's one of those issues. But we do need to uh, think about how we can promote it. Maybe healthcare reform will force us into this, but we often still work in silos, and we don't take advantage of the crossover that we could have. Um, so it's very important, I think, that we are creating programs to maximize patient benefit and system efficiency, such as patient navigation. With regard to the general public, we've talked about job creation, how important it is in the health sector. We do want to encourage people to volunteer to join the care force, whether they are a caregiver, a formal volunteer, or an advocate. All of you sitting in this room are part of the care force as well as perhaps the professional workforce. I believe there are some people who are not part of, part of the professional workforce, but that doesn't mean you can't be an advocate. And perhaps most importantly, we would love to encourage anyone that we can to consider a professional career in cancer. We just badly need more people. This is a list of 31 groups that have endorsed uh, our national initiative, and the reason it's here is because we want you to see whether or not your organization is listed. If it's not listed, we have in the back a yellow sheet, and we would be delighted if you could add your organization's name to this list of, of organizations who are endorsing this national uh, workforce initiative. Uh, we have 31 here. We'd love to st end the day with 50, so I just throw that out as a bit of a challenge. But we are very, very excited about the initiatives. I think we've made some good progress. As I said, it's just a starting point, but working together as a group of all professions and as the care force and the workforce, we might actually be able to move that needle. Thank you.